All statements and opinions expressed by guests of the Adult in the Room podcast are strictly their own and do not necessarily reflect the beliefs or opinions of the host, producers, or advertisers. All interviews are presented in their most complete possible form in the interests of free speech. No statements should be interpreted as financial, legal, or medical advice. Listener and viewer discretion are strongly advised. It's the Adult in the Room podcast with Victoria Taft. That's me. Darren Beatty is the beating heart of a new publication, relatively new, called Revolver.News. And he's been at the forefront of the journalistic investigation into federal involvement in the January 6, 2021 riots on Capitol Hill. That's right. The federal involvement in orchestrating or taking great part in what Beatty calls the Fed surrection. And there are plenty of questions to be answered about their involvement uh, when there had never been riots or violence at Trump events before over a period of years. And now, now there would be violence after a rocky and weird 2020 election. Maybe, but it seemed out of character with Trump supporters. And there was plenty to be angry about, obviously. But violence and riots? Well, so Beatty has written the foreword to the January 6th committee's report on the events of that day. And you will be stunned by some of his revelations that he writes. I know I was, and I thought I knew quite a bit about it, but he is a former political science professor at Duke University. He was a rare supporter of Donald Trump. Uh, when he ran for president the first time in the ivory towers of education, Donald Trump didn't run there. Darren Beatty was there. And it was, I'm sure, really great in the faculty lounge when he said, you know, I really like that Trump guy. <laughs> so, uh, very soon thereafter, coincidentally, he left academia and he ended up being a speechwriter for Donald Trump. I cannot wait to find out how that gig came around and how he got hired up by the Trump candidacy and the Trump uh, presidency. Well. He was drummed out of that job when CNN and the awful, really awful, look into it, Southern Poverty Law Center, depicted him as a white nationalist because everybody who works for Donald Trump is a white nationalist, don't you know? And uh, it was over a, an, a, uh, an academic speech he gave at an institute about H.L. Uh, Mencken. So here it is. Here we are doing some of the most bracing coverage on January 6th on the pages, if you will, of Revolver.News. Darren Beatty, welcome to the Adult in the Room podcast with Victoria Taft. How you doing? It's great to be here with you. Thank you. Let's let's start big and get smaller, if we can. You ask, uh, was January 6th, the riot there, an intelligence failure or an intelligence operation? What do you, you wrote those those words in your forward. So what do you think now? Well, you know, it's an interesting and um, kind of a radical question to ask. And it's a question that has, I think, reshaped the way that a lot of the country thinks about January 6th, which remember in the official narrative, this is an insurrection and not just any insurrection. It's an insurrection on par with 9-11 or on par with the civil war in terms of the trauma that it allegedly inflicted on the country. And this is from, this isn't just, you know, coming from the you know, the, the the rabid corners of MSNBC and so forth. This is from Joe Biden and, you know, other very prominent uh, political officials who have made these pretty ridiculous and indeed scandalous comparisons. And what I've suggested and argued and, uh, and, and what Revolver.News has covered, I think, to such, uh, such great effect and influence is that actually January 6th was not an insurrection. It was something that we might call a fed surrection. Now, that's a, a catchy uh, term that you know Trump loves. <laughs> you know, he's, he's, uh, he's adopted it to some degree. But what does it mean? Does it mean that every participant in the January 6th riot or whatever you want to call it was a card carrying member of the FBI, of course not. What it means, at least in my sense, in the revolver.news sense, is the following. It means that had it not been for a handful 
of critical participants in January 6, who each played critical and mutually complementary roles. Had it not been for these individuals, the preconditions would not have been set for the rally to turn into a riot. And furthermore, these individuals in question are overwhelmingly likely to have some non-public connection with the federal government, and they are certainly being protected by the federal government from indictment, prosecution, and, and, uh, and such in a manner that does not lend itself to any obvious innocent explanation. And one of these figures that I'm alluding to is now kind of a household name, or at least as much as a kind of alleged Fed provocateur can become a household name, is an individual called Ray Epps, whom Revolver News helped bring to the national attention. And I think most people have heard about him or at least seen the video about him. And the video in this case kind of speaks for itself. And I'd be happy to get into detail about him. But there are other characters as well. Remember, I mentioned a handful of key actors, each playing mutually complementary roles. And unlike Epps, there are other figures who are equally, if not more egregious in terms of their participation, who, unlike Epps, who is at least a known quantity, haven't even been identified, who, unlike Epps, whom the FBI at least implicitly acknowledged how egregious his behavior was when they included him as one of the first 20 people on their most wanted list for January 6th. Incidentally, they scrubbed him off literally the day after Revolver News ran our first piece exploring federal involvement. Literally the day after, and we interpolated this using the Wayback Machine to show show this. And the media generally and the sort of the January 6 witch hunters did a complete about face on uh, Ray Epps after this happened. The New York Times did a ominously titled Day of Rage feature on January 6, in which Ray Epps, of all people, the footage of Ray Epps was included as, you know, supporting the thesis that the MAGA people were planning to go into the Capitol in advance, which is reasonable that they should use that because Ray Epps is the only guy caught on camera as early as January 5th telling people to go into the Capitol, into the Capitol. So it's natural that the New York Times, in their desire to amplify this dangerous terrorist insurrection thesis, of all the available footage, they correctly identified the Epps footage as the most damning and incriminating to the Trump crowd. And yet, after the FBI scrubbed Epps off their most wanted list, other interesting things happened. The New York Times had a change of heart. They go from featuring Epps in their day of rage feature on January 6th to having one of their most obedient lapdog journalists probably crawl on all fours all the way over to Ray Epps' trailer in order to do an exclusive on him. And it's a fully dedicated puff piece to Ray Epps that asks none of the questions and produces not even an attempt at resolving any of the damning questions that we raise. It's just a sympathy piece in which Ray Epps complains, oh, those, if it hadn't been for Revolver News and Tucker Carlson, my life would have been ruined. Your life is ruined, Ray Epps. Unlike others who are rotting away in prison or less, you're free, you're unindicted, and you recently sold your stupid ranch for millions of dollars, and now you're standing in front of a trailer acting like it's a big sob story. The whole thing is ridiculous. But, but the thing is this, think about it. Ray Epps, the guy, the big, the big strong guy in full camo gear, military camo gear with a Trump hat, the guy who's telling people in advance, go into the Capitol, the guy who's a veritable Where's Waldo on January 6th from the very early morning, directing people to the Capitol saying, when Trump's speech is over, go to the Capitol. That's where our problems are. It's in that direction. Spread the word over and over and over and over. Ray Epps, the guy who skipped Trump's speech, by the way, entirely. He went to hear it with his he son. He all the way from Arizona across the country. He and just never Trump bothered speech. to go see it. And, and what does he do instead? 
he just happens to mosey on over to the Capitol and happens to be pre-positioned at the exact place and the exact time where that initial decisive assault on the Western perimeter of the Capitol occurred. And he's just not sort of vaguely in the mix. He's right up there front and center. And in fact, there's footage of him whispering in a guy's ear literally two seconds before the guy goes on to break down the barricades. And as we've learned in the course of uh, you know, the public transcripts on Ray Epps, he actually texted his nephew saying, I orchestrated it. It doesn't, it doesn't get more, you know, black and white than that. And yet this guy, oh, also, he happened to have been the president of the Arizona chapter of the Oath Keepers, the most demonized and heavily prosecuted militia group associated with January 6th. And in this broad context, and in the context in which the New York Times has every incentive and a complete history of amplifying the insurrection, evil, terrorist, MAGA, Trump supporter version of January 6th, of all the people, they choose this guy to be the subject of their fully dedicated puff piece. And it gets even weirder because Adam Kinsinger, talking about crawling on all fours, they call him Crybaby Kinsinger. He's probably on all fours more than he is on two feet for most of his life. So Crybaby Kinsinger, who is one of the nominal Republicans as part of this January 6th committee, they say it's bipartisan. And what they mean by that is it consists of Democrats who hate Trump supporters and Trump and Republicans who hate Trump supporters and Trump even more. And Crybaby Kinsinger is one of those people along with Liz Cheney, the kind of gender ambiguous scion of one of the most disgraced war criminal families in the history of our country. And these are the two champions that they picked to be the Republicans on the committee. But Adam Kinsinger, it comes out in the public a transcript of the January 6th interrogation of Epps. This is something really weird. Remember, Kinsinger never met a Trump supporter that he didn't want to see rotting away in prison for less than 50 years. And here in the course of the transcript, you see Adam Kinsinger, of all people, more vigorously defending Ray Epps than Ray Epps' own lawyer. Ray Epps' lawyer, who happens to be a nine-year veteran of the Phoenix field office of the FBI, incidentally. Yeah, that's and, another mind blower. Gee, I wonder it, if he were some sort of informant, too. Hmm. No, it's it, it's it's wild. And Adam Kinsinger is lit. It's, it's, people have to look at this transcript. Adam Kinsinger is bending over backwards to offer the most implausibly charitable interpretations of one inconsistency after another, after another, one lie after another, after another. The whole thing doesn't add up at all. The whole thing does not even come remotely close to lending itself to an innocent explanation for this. Anyone with common sense and a common understanding understands that Ray Epps is one of the smoking guns of the Fed's erection. But the whole point is the Ray Epps isn't even the full story. There, at least Ray Epps has been identified. There are other people like this scaffold commander that oh, I've talked Before we do that, I just want to mention one thing about Ray Epps. When he's yeah. on January 5th video saying that, you know, well, I could go for, to jail for this, or I know that, the, you know, they could throw the book at me or whatever words that he said, he was doing that to inoculate, uh, to, to inoculate the people at whom he was yelling and urging so that they would know what they were doing was wrong. If in fact they ever did participate in that. And, um, and he did that for illegal reasons so that the FBI could come back or DHS or whoever could come back and say, well, see, they knew what it was wrong. They, there was no chance that it would be something that they, you know, just had no idea about. They they did that on purpose. They used to do that with the 9-11 guy or not 9-11 guys, but the subsequent uh, federal indictments of people that they got on terrorism charges and they would make sure that they knew there was some legal reason for that. And so I saw him doing that and I thought, oh, uh-huh. Yeah, he's a Fed or something. That's interesting. You know, I'm not I'm not sure about the 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 legal aspect of that, but I will say this that I mean, I mentioned the many inconsistencies and 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 lies in the in the transcript uh, coming from Epps. One of them, this gives you a sense of how blatant this is. One of them was they asked Ray Epps, they said, what the hell possessed you to get people to go in the capital in the first place? You know, where did this idea come from? Why are you doing this? And he said, 
you know what? It was just kind of an idea in the air. And furthermore, it's like it's like the Phil wow. Collins. It's you know, it was in the air. Nobody was talking about it other than other than Epps. But it gets even <laughs> it gets even weirder because Ray Epps said, and plus. I thought it was totally legal. I thought the Capitol would be open. I oh, thought we, they would just I oh, thought really? they would just let people in. Which oh, is interesting really? because we do have video of the Capitol Police just letting people in, but in a rather right. different context, right? But yes. he said, Oh, I just thought they would let people in. And then, you know, the natural follow up question that the January sixth committee people asked, Kinsage or not, but others in the committee asked, which the New York New York Times in their puff piece didn't even bother to explore. They asked, Well, if you thought that this was legal, why did you preface all of your exhortations to the crowd, just like you said, with saying some like in this methodical, rehearsed fashion, I'm probably going to go to jail for this. I'm probably going to get arrested for this, blah, blah, blah. And, and his response was, gee, I don't know. Maybe that was a poor choice of words. <laughs> it's like, and there, there's, a, there's another one where, Famous, iconic footage. You've seen it. I think most people have seen it by now. It's when Ray Epps says, we need to go in the Capitol. And immediately the crowd catches on and start calling him a fed. You've seen that? They say, fed, fed. Now, Ray Epps was asked about this. So what about all these people calling you a fed? And he said, you know, I don't really think that happened. And I, I asked my son too, and he didn't <laughs> think that happened. I think it's possible that... This could have been doctored and edited into the video afterwards. I laughed. Like, I just this laughed. Is, this is the planet this guy is living on. It's total, I don't know if it's complete delusion. I don't know if it's just a kind of chutzpah that relates to his sense of invincibility and the fact that he's protected for reasons that, again, yeah. let, you know, lend themselves to no innocent explanation. Um, but it is, uh, this is... This is Ray Epps. He's he's, and he he's a big mis you know he's a mistake. It's you know it gets back to that original question: intelligence failure or intelligence operation? Well, it might be a little bit of both. You know, if it were success, we wouldn't be talking about Ray Epps right now. You know, Ray Epps is someone who is, in my mind, you know, is 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 a professional who is who is very good at what he does. Like his. Um, skill in crowd control is actually very impressive, but where I think he went wrong is he's an older fellow. He's been in the game for a long time. He's probably been, you know, doing these kind of gray area type on and off jobs for whatever kind of network in, you know, vaguely associated with, you know, with the military might be doing this kind of stuff. And it's not, it's not his first rodeo in all likelihood, but being an older gentleman, and not that there's anything wrong with that, but being an older gentleman, he has different kind of software. And even though he's like consciously aware that people have phones and other things, it he doesn't process it to the level where he understands the implications of this for his operational security. He doesn't understand that every single interaction he has from January 5th to 6th is going to be on camera and all over the internet. In fact, because maybe he wasn't in charge of OPSEC. Maybe he was just doing his job and depending you know, on others that, to do it for know, him. That's also a possibility, but I think he, he probably would have conducted himself a little bit differently had he understood the implications of, you know, what it, like the, uh, one fellow was, he was a live streamer and he was carrying like this live stream equipment where people could do super chats and those super chats would be automatically read out loud. And, you know, Ray Epps was clearly perplexed by what this is and just was calling the guard, oh, you and your silly machine, you're not even, you know, that kind of thing. It's like, um, so I do think there's an element where he didn't fully appreciate just how every single little detail, including a lot of the stuff that he was you know, expressing uh, sotto voce, as it were, in whispered tones to others. A lot of that was even picked up. And in fact, one particular clip became very relevant um, to yet another inconsistency and contradiction in his account. So I think that's kind of where where he slipped up. And if it hadn't been for that slip up, and in, frankly, if it hadn't been for Revolver News, has been very persistent on this, on the Ray Epps question and, and on the pipe bomb issue, which I call the other smoking gun of January 6th, uh, 
you know, they would have gotten away with it completely. And, you know, still, I think it's fair to say they've largely gotten away with it, but not without um, not without cost, because I think the half half of the country that understands the nature of the regime and is rightly skeptical of the regime um now uh thanks to these types of conversations and you know re the reporting on this um have shall we say reasonable doubts as to the authenticity of you know several of these key actors in January 6 and that Thankfully, I think undermines the force of the regime's insurrection narrative, which I think it's important to point out in context. The reason that this is being pushed so aggressively is that it's used to facilitate the weaponization of the national security state against the American people for political reasons. That's what's at stake in this domestic terrorist narrative of January 6th. And that's why even though I think most people by now, it's over two years ago, people ready to move on. People are concerned about, you know, buying eggs and, you know, uh, communist balloons and things like this. <laughs> they, want to, they want to move on with the next scandal. But the reason that this is important is, you know, what's at stake here is right. a very serious and dangerous trend in our politics, which is the political weaponization of our national security apparatus. To affect politics. Yeah, you said the political weaponization. Well, before we go to uh, the guy on the scaffolding and that sort of thing, at one point in, in your foreword to the January 6th um, report, you talk about that, you know, this whole idea about, or maybe it was one of your interviews, forgive me, but you really think that the Nancy Pelosi not getting the feds there or Capitol Police and enough numbers and that sort of thing, planning for January 6th, because there were reports that there was going to be some trouble. Uh, you think that that's almost a sideshow only because you believe that there's a bigger there's a bigger point at stake, which I believe is what you just said, that the feds were involved and they did it in the name of furthering a narrative, and an idea that people of a particular political persuasion are really the enemy. Is that, do I characterize yes, that properly? I, mean, I certainly think that it's significant that the capital, I mean, it would be weird enough if the capital had ordinary security on January 6th. Because again, there is a very significant and very politically controversial proceeding that everybody knew was going to take place on that day. So it'd been very weird simply to have ordinary levels of security, but that's not what they had. They didn't even have ordinary levels. They had uniquely poor levels of security on all days, you know, uh, January 6th. Why is this day different from any other day? You, they, they have uniquely poor security, and that is absolutely uh, suspicious and absolutely worth talking about. And, you know, if Nancy Pelosi had pushed to have additional security, they probably would have gotten it. You know, Trump, I, I spoke with Trump about this at great length, actually, in a recent interview we did, phone interview. It's about an hour long. It's on the phone. People say it's more like a candid conversation between friends than even an interview. It's done very well. It's actually, it's surpassed 7 million views on Rumble, if you can believe that. It's pretty crazy. And it's the most extensive conversation I think that Trump's ever had publicly about the criminality of the national security state and specifically about the Fed's erection. Um, he brings up how you know he made repeated attempts to increase security and all of those attempts uh, were curiously... Um, and I would say damningly denied. And certainly Nancy Pelosi is a figure in that. Um, I guess what I would say, though, in addition to that, um, is that, you know, Nancy Pelosi is such a kind of political hot rod that I think people are led down rabbit holes with different kind of theories in which Nancy Pelosi herself, who's, you know, an impressive woman, but like she's, She's an 80 plus year old lady and people are attributing all kinds of theories that kind of cast her as a sort of mastermind or major figure in this. And that's where I get doubtful. I think she, like others, you know, probably if they have any common sense, 
know that you know there's some dirty stuff going on and not to touch it and to play along you know if only because it works in their favor politically but i don't think there's any kind of you know master mining on on her part i think these things uh, take place take place elsewhere and people like pelosi and people like kinsinger pick up on cues or maybe maybe even something like this is purely speculative but I could imagine Adam Kinsinger getting a call at some point from somebody that he knows that he's supposed to listen to. And that person might say something like, look, uh, the Ray Epps issue is is pretty complicated, but um, we've got to we've got to protect him. OK, let me get something to like that. This relates to the Nancy Pelosi situation in a way, and that is that the DHS guy who was supposed to have written the threat assessment leading up to January 6th, according to your forward, ended up on the committee. He ended up as, a, as an apparatchik on the committee. And so you said he, he should have been a witness, not a guy writing right. the report. He should have been responding to the report or responding to questions at right. the very no, least. There are a lot of things like this. So you're referring to a guy who is a He's a career DHS guy who should have written a threat assessment in the DHS, which is a routine thing to do before big events like what you know Jan January six. For whatever reason, they didn't do a threat assessment, which is a total contravention of the protocol. And yeah, again, instead of like asking the guy what the hell's going on, why didn't you do a threat assessment? This career DHS guy. Um, Liz Cheney kind of inexplicably hires him to be on the staff of the January 6th committee. The DHS connection and it's, is its own interesting rabbit hole because, among other things, you know, DHS generally is at the tip of the spear in terms of the reconfiguration of the national security state as a political weapon against Trump supporters and, and the right more generally. But more specifically, the chair of the January 6th committee, Benny Thompson, is the Department of Homeland Security's stooge in Congress. He's a seven-time chair of the Homeland Security Committee. So I think it's interesting of all of the Democrat hacks that could have been chosen to chair this committee, it's the DHS's stooge who's chosen to have that position. Um, which is, uh, I think, interesting for a number of reasons. Um, you know, in the DHS, you recall, DHS is not a law enforcement agency. It has a unit that is able to do intelligence. And uh, part of the significance of that is that um, Ray Epps' lawyer, whom I mentioned was a nine-year veteran of, of the Phoenix FBI field office, he went on this parade tour presumably to debunk in you know, all the reporting from Revolver News and, and such, saying Ray Epps is not a member of the FBI. He's never been involved with the FBI, and he has never been involved with any law enforcement organization. And I noticed this lawyer was clinging on to the phrase law enforcement for dear life. I'm saying, well, why is that phrase so important to this formulation? And the answer is, well, perhaps the Department of Homeland Security is not a law enforcement organization. Military intelligence is not a law enforcement organization. Any kind of private contractor arrangement connected with those institutions would also not be a law enforcement organization. And in fact, some reporter who picked up on the significance of this distinction asked the lawyer, well, can you similarly deny that Ray Epps was involved with any government agency? To which the lawyer replied, not to my knowledge, which is an interesting contrast to the specific and explicit, repeated and emphatic denials of any involvement with law enforcement to when asked about any involvement with any government agency, not to my knowledge, where, well, clearly they had some discussions that led him to be able to deny the law enforcement. And presumably, if those discussions enabled him to deny any government agency, he would have been happy to do so. But instead, not to my knowledge. So I'll leave it, you know, to the 
audience to infer what that might mean. The scaffold commander guy, we still don't know who he was. And you have had some resources at your disposal to pretty much go to the ends of the earth to figure out who this guy is. What have you found out? And what role did he play on January 6th, if you don't mind going over that old saw again? But I think it's fascinating to people who aren't really up to speed on this issue. Well, the long story short on this guy, and again, I encourage anyone who wants to get the full story with the video, go to revolver.news. We have it easily available, two side columns, January 6th series, read Ray Epps Part 1, Ray Epps Part 2. In Ray Epps Part 2, we go through all these casts of characters, including scaffold commanders, so you can really get a visual and visceral sense of what I'm talking about. And the long story short of it is Scavel Commander is one of the other key players in January 6. He's cutting fencing and cutting barriers in advance of Trump's speech, which is significant because when people, when the crowd goes to the Capitol, the barriers are removed and they don't realize they're even trespassing. But it gets even worse because the Scavel Commander positioned himself on top of scaffolding with a big bullhorn and just repeatedly and this authoritative booming voice coming from on high through the through the through the bullhorn move forward move forward move forward move forward we need your help move forward so if you're part of the crowd you're thinking what's going on is somebody injured do they need medical assistance do we need to clear the way so you know medical per- emergency personnel can get there you move forward or People in front of you move forward and you move forward just as a matter of, you know, just how crowd dynamics I mean, work. I saw your I saw your sped up video on the crowd uh, breaking through. And Ab- I was just sh- I mean, of course, I've seen it close up. But it was so in close Confederacy that it was dangerous for people to be in that huge amount of people. It was it was I mean, I can't imagine anyone going, oh, OK, I'll just I'll just budge up. I'll crowd I'll crowd in knowing that you were putting yourself in peril. There was nowhere to go. You might get crushed as it happened uh, with what is it? Roseanne Boylan also got crushed and beaten and all kinds of things but right um, yeah so so, so- just to finish on the scaffold commander he's telling people to move forward he, he's a key player he he plays a key role and unlike ray epps he wasn't put on the you know first 20 most wanted list unlike ray epps we don't even know who he is the government has exhibited no public interest in him whatsoever and so i think if his identity actually became known it would be one of the biggest scandals in the country. And so I've done my part to try to identify who he is. Um, but so far, unfortunately, I've been unsuccessful. But it's not for not for a lack of trying and it's not for a lack of uh, uh, resourcefulness. Um, but yeah, he's he's one of the open question marks, the open mysteries, in some cases, one of the open wounds um, of the whole uh, January uh, 6th uh, Fed Surrection saga, then that's Scaffold Commander. Yeah. Um, now, one of the other hobby horses you have been riding, because it's super important, is the pipe bomb situation. And how that has not been, quote unquote, solved yet, that, uh, that a pittance has been thrown at trying to find that person and the odd coincidences that have to occur in order for the pipe bomb story to even wash. What's the latest on that? Well, again, there is there is no um, there is no light. The latest is you know there are so many inconsistencies. You know the circumstances under which the RNC pipe bomb was discovered, the circumstances under which the DNC pipe bomb was not discovered. You know for seventeen hours. Those are equally and independently so unlikely as to be impossible, and yet they both happen, and both had to happen in order for the official version of uh, of, of of the pipe bomb story to make sense. And so we've discussed, we've covered the pipe bomb thing so extensively, and people can read people can read it. You mentioned that I wrote the introduction to the committee report. The committee report is actually a public document, like the nine eleven report. Um, various publishing houses have taken upon themselves to re- release this in a book format. Usually, 
in addition to an introduction to the material solicited by some kind of journalist or expert. And, you know, other publishing houses have done it and they've just gotten some establishment hack to do it. Skyhorse Publishing, however, which is a subsidiary of Simon & Schuster, so they're a pretty mainstream organization, they took the great risk of asking me to give an introduction and to Ah. give an introduction of it that does not- You didn't approach them? I was thinking it might be a troll. That does not conform to, um, you know, the- CNN regime lies that you can get anywhere else. You can, if you want to get the lies and the the kind of low IQ, mediocre sort of cattle slop. If you want your feeding of cattle slop from the spoon, you can crawl your way over to Adam Kinsinger's Twitter timeline. But for the people who can stomach the truth and the real version, uh, Skyhorse has it available. It's a January 6th committee report, Skyhorse version with an introduction by yours truly, uh, Aaron Beatty. And in that, I go in great detail um, uh, about the pipe bomb issue. And of course, as always, the full story with the video, with in some cases really hilarious exclusive videos that we put together to illustrate how crazy the pipe bomb story is. Revolver.news it's January coverage. Just you've to done, give people- You've, you've a, done things other people haven't done. You've done things that law enforcement hasn't answer, answered and addressed. You know, it's it's wild. But just to give people an example, like, and, you know, it's informed, you know, the reality of things is you never, you never get the full story about anything. There are always layers within layers within layers. And that gets us to, you know, almost philosophical territory to discuss like what is the nature of knowing things and what does it mean to even know things or to be, you know, certain about something to one's satisfaction. Um, There's a great uh, documentary that I'd recommend people watch um, called Mirage Men that I think inadvertently maybe explore some of these themes to give people a sense there's always another layer. You never have that. We're all striving to this satisfaction of had knowing the final and full truth of things, but that's just not how things work. So it, in that sense, it's always nice to have something that can be definitive and black and white. And in the case of the pipe bomb, revolver.news, we have definitively shown, definitively proved that the FBI is in possession of footage of the pipe bomber actually planting the bomb and they've they're withholding that footage. And that's really weird in the context of, again, all of the um, aforementioned discrepancies uh, surrounding the story of the DNC pipe bomb and how it was laying out there allegedly for 17 hours and nobody found it, including the Secret Service who swept the building because, as we learned a year later, after a long cover-up, Kamala Harris was actually in the building and she was the VP-elect enjoying secret service protection. So, but we show that there's a camera that they have, that they should have other footage from this camera that would have provided a very clear angle that would depict whether and how the pipe bomber planted the bomb and they choose not to show us that footage. And furthermore, we show that there's artificial tampering to the surveillance footage, tampering of the frame rate such as to make it virtually impossible to identify anything about this pipe bomber. And why would that be? Why would it be, for that matter, that the Democrats would exhibit zero interest in uncovering the identity of this ostensible MAGA Trump-loving terrorist who planted explosive devices outside of their own national headquarters? Why is it that Revolver News is more interested in finding out who this guy is than the Democrats themselves? That's another question that seems to elude any um, any innocent explanation. And, you know, there are a lot of those questions when you really look into the underbelly of January 6th. 41,000 hours of video or recorded uh, recordings of the the riot and pre-riot, pre-whatever we're calling it, what do you think they'll find? 
Are you involved in any way in looking through that stuff? You know, I'm I'm giving some kind of invite advice in an informal way, uh, but you know, I'm not directly involved with it. And you know, I think it's just we have to wait and see. Um, to me, I I think it's better than nothing. It's potentially you know very high leverage thing. It's potentially very great, but um, I'm concerned. What I don't want it to be is this kind of wild goose chase or kind of needle in the haystack situation where Kevin McCarthy just dumps, you know, tens of thousands of hours of, you know, surveillance footage uh, and is like, okay, here you go. And then, you know, while we're looking into this for, you know, weeks, months, maybe even longer, you know, they just move on. It's like, okay, here's your consolation prize, you know, have fun with it. Here's 40,000 hours Here's 40,000 hours. And um, so I think that, and this applies generally to the approach that I advocate for the congressional committees that are researching, you know, uh, investigating, you know, government abuses here is um, really, uh, I think the best chance of success comes from an extremely targeted, narrow, specific approach to what you're looking for and what you, what you want. And for that reason, I would say that the I would rather have the DNC surveillance footage of the pipe bomber than the 40,000 hours of footage from the Capitol. Because again, from the... Although... The capital footage, my best hope for the capital footage is it will help us um, get some better uh, footage of the scaffold commander because the capital does have cameras around the peace monument area where scaffold commander and some of those other people were hanging out. So that I think is the most kind of optimistic outcome for for this is we, we're, we're better able to identify some of these key actors that I've described and alluded to earlier. There is also a chance, of course, that we'll see more violations on the part of the Capitol Police. We'll see more examples of them opening the doors to people, maybe more examples of the Capitol Police unnecessarily and unjustly brutalizing the crowd. But the thing is, we already have those videos. So even those videos might help to kind of reinforce some of what we have before, but I don't anticipate any kind of um, meaningful shift at the narrative level from those because we already have that type of footage. And so I think the most meaningful thing that we could get is footage that helps us to identify some of these other people. And if and when they're identified, that can take this story to the next level. And so, um, so, and, but that could just be a bias because these are the things that I happen to be focusing on in my research. But there's a reason I'm focusing on it because I think these are the highest leverage places with the best chance of payoff. And that is Ray Epps and the Ray Epps breach site at the Peace Monument area and the pipe bomb. Ray Epps and the pipe bomber, in my estimation, are the two smoking guns of the January mm -hmm. insurrection. Yeah. Um, can I just ask you a question about your about revolver.news and the genesis of that and how you got involved? Well, you know, it's it's not something that I expected to be doing, but then again, I didn't really expect to be writing speeches for the president in the White House. <laughs> I certainly wouldn't have wouldn't have expected that president to have been Donald Trump. You know, it's one of those things if they ask you ten years ago, like what what you would <laughs> end up doing, uh, I would never have have guessed it. But it's been it's been very successful and very fun, and I think very important and. As for Revolver News, which began as a kind of with with a mind toward you know being an aggregation site uh, to kind of replace Drudge Report, which has fallen out of favor with a lot of people, and it still provides you know some you know, the best aggregation that people will see. Um, uh, but it became something more than that. It's become a true investigative powerhouse, a true analytic powerhouse. And really, the kind of site that a lot of people can't believe is is still on the internet. It's something, it's something very special, and it's not a it's not even your typical sort of conservative site because you know a lot of, a lot of 
sites on, on the right, they don't really drive or shape narratives. What they'll do is they'll kind of feed, they'll feed people, people's kind of cathartic desire for righteous indignation. They'll point out the hypocrisies. They'll say, look at what bad Biden has done now. Look at what Hunter's done now. Did you see the, you know, the Hunter was caught with another hooker. Like how right. outrageous. I mean, I've done my that? share of that stuff. And, and I've done then, my share, but it's just boring. And, and it's then boring the next after a while. Day, and then the next day, it's like, here's another hooker. <laughs> Hunter <laughs> Biden was caught with another hooker. This one is blonde. It's not the brunette like last time. And then every day it's a new hooker with Hunter Biden and it's a new kind of outrage. And um, but even on a more kind of narrative level, it's sort of uh, you, you see this like, look at this racist thing that Biden said 30 years ago, which, you know, frankly, those usually end up being the most sensible things he's ever said. <laughs> <laughs> That's a terrible say, thing to say. <laughs> look, look at look at what, you know, Biden, Biden said something was that was racist and tough on crime 30 years ago. It's like, damn, I wish Republicans would have the balls to say something like this now. Like a lot of I, I would I would like Biden from 30 years ago better than most Republicans. But so people are kind of in, in, in enmeshed in this kind of they're they're not driving narratives. They're just sort of pointing at hypocrisies and feeding it to outrage. And this, you know, and this can generate a lot of views, um, but it's but it's not on the offensive because it's in a kind of reactive position to circumstances that are laid out for them. And what what I try to do with Revolver News is kind of take take an offensive position. And I think, frankly, the January 6th example is a good one because before, you know, and conservatives, people on the right, you know, we're, we're, we're not dumb. We're very perceptive. We know when we're being conned and lied to, but people don't always have the, the words to describe exactly what's going on. So very from very early on, people knew there was something off with January 6th. Oh, absolutely. And, and a lot of people, a lot of people were saying, Oh, this is Antifa. This is Antifa, right? And, and I, I mean, there were people changing out of Black Block and yeah, into were, MAGA saying, gear. Antifa, this is Antifa. And you know, who knows? Maybe there there was some of that. Who knows? Maybe there was some of that. But that was sort of that was the way that people expressed their underlying kind of visceral sense that there's something really weird and off here. Um, but then. And- let me just interject here about the yeah. Joe Biden uh, racist stuff. And he's talked about the the at least one infamous example, talking about how he didn't want his kids to go to school in a racial jungle and he didn't want busing. And a lot of black, I don't know what about then, but a lot of black parents, in you know, they didn't want their kids bust either. So I think that's, I mean, I have to believe that's where he came from. And where anybody, came from. anybody who wants to take a look at some of these videos circulating around of what actually this looks like in practice where you see, you know, kids getting, you know, beaten up by, you know, people much bigger than them. I mean, all I'll say about that is, you know, whatever. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, it's, it's crazy. um, uh, But, you know, he's, he's said overtly racist things before. I mean, talking about Barack Obama, Indians working at 7-Elevens. I mean, it's just like, just shut up. You are just not helping yourself, dude. I just... Anyway, um, right. Keep going. I'm um, sorry, Darren. Yeah. Uh, but but this Antifa thing, people are going on Antifa, and then Revolver News said, "Well, what about what about the feds? You know, it's it's the feds." And then once you know, and it's in a way, it could seem like a subtle shift from Antifa to feds, but it meant everything. That touched a nerve, and you could see it in the media's response to it. The media went absolutely apoplectic. It was a full-scale meltdown, and all of a sudden, Revolver News and Darren Beatty became the most dangerous conspiracy theorists on the planet. They freaked out, and they're still trying to get us. We have full-time Soros-paid operatives who are paid effectively to, you know, uh, you know, sniff through my trash and stuff like that. Like, there, there's some very disgusting people, but that's what touched a nerve and it that gives you and it's shaped the conversation in a proactive basis and that's something that they're they're not really anticipating because not a lot of people on the right um 
do that. And I think there's a, there's a place for everything, but um, there is a, I think, unique value to being able to proactively shape narratives and to create conversations that are not on the on the terms set by by the regime and by the enemy and that's what that's what I strive to do on on a narrative level and I guess thematically one theme that's sort of running through a lot of our um, exclusive coverage at Revolver is the theme that the national security state has become weaponized politically against the right. And now I think it's something that people understand on a, on a, on a much broader level, but it's taken some work to get there. And I think part of the reason for that is that people on the right and conservatives, just a matter of their political psychology, there's a tendency to want to revere institutions of authority. Uh, people on the right dispositionally want to revere the Pentagon. They want to revere the military. They even want to revere the FBI, and they certainly want to revere, you know, the police and all of these other institutions. And um, the notion that many, if not all, of these institutions have been corrupted with the same virus that's infecting other institutions is a very difficult pill to swallow. But it's a necessary pill to swallow. But it has to be presented in a certain way. And I think part of Revolver News's um, achievement has been helping to introduce the right to the new reality that the national security state um, is not only not you know not to be revered as such, but is actively hostile toward them, and that's simply an unfortunate reality of our situation in America. I was once in favor of the Patriot Act. Right. Bad news bears, man. I mean, now we're getting, I mean, now you can't even be an attorney with a particular point of view and get together with the president and say, this is my, this is my legal opinion without it being weaponized against you. I mean, that's what happened to John Eastman. That's what's happened to so many people. I, you know, it's, it's just astonishing. Can you answer me one thing? So the Proud Boys are in court as we speak and they're being uh, tried. And among those are, uh, among those is uh, Enrique Terrio, who's a uh, black Hispanic, uh, now I guess former head of Proud Boys, who wasn't even in DC on January 6th. And he's being, and he's also an FBI informant, and he's being castigated and you know brought up on charges now for J six. What gives? I'm puzzled by the situation too, uh, so I'm reluctant to say one thing or another. Um, as far as the the Proud Boys generally, um, I a, a subtext, and not just a subtext, but an important part of the Revolver News thesis that we show in great detail, including video in the Ray Epps Part 2 uh, piece that I mentioned that people can go to revolver.news right after they see this and go through it and see what I mean, is that the official story is that really the insurrection kicks off in earnest when the Proud Boys get to the peace monument and start causing trouble like around the bike rack. But what Revolver shows is that there are key casts of characters, each of whom plays a critical role in this, complementary role in this, including cutting down fencing and so forth. And they're hanging out pre-positioned at the Peace Monument site before the Proud Boys get there. And unlike the Proud Boys, who've received a tremendous amount of attention here, the cast of characters that I mentioned played, I think, a more significant role in everything, and certainly in the case of Scaffold Commander, a more significant role. Certainly the case of Ray Epps, a more significant role. These people haven't been uh, indicted, and many haven't even been identified, and that's, and that's weird. With that being said, um, the Proud Boys and all these other militia groups, I think it's fair to say at this point that for the most part, these are so... Uh, infiltrated by feds that people just need to stay the hell away from it. You know, Enrique Tario, I can't say whether, you know, who knows, you know, 
he was an FBI informant in the past. Does that mean that he continued the relationship? I can't say. I'm not in a can position. You ever quit, can you ever quit that relationship unless it's started out, unless it's started by the officer and no, him or herself? No, it's a complicated thing, but it is bizarre because the reason that Tario wasn't in D.C. then was that he had this weird kind of legal issue where he yeah. drove he down the Black into Lives D.C. Matter banner. and was like he drove into D.C. and was immediately apprehended with a bunch of guns. And then the punishment was that he couldn't be in D.C., which seemed to be pretty convenient about the day. So there are a lot of interesting things there. But again, like I don't know and I can't really say either way, but there are definite questions there and definite questions with, you know, another Proud Boy um uh, uh, Joe Biggs, he's a publicly known to have been an FBI informant. Now, the context in which he was informed, at least that we're aware of, is that he was telling you know them about Antifa because you know the feds are interested in Antifa too. But again, it's like, what does a relationship like that look like? Could it be? And how you know how could it look if if he's in touch with some kind of handler? The handler might have been interested in January 6th. The handler might have said, look, you know, just keep me apprised of what's going on for your guys' safety. You know, you have the right to do it. But, you know, just say say what you're planning on doing. You say, oh, you know, or uh, and and it goes like that. Is is that informing? Is that not? There are layers of plausible deniability. But uh, the fact is that many of these Proud Boys at a senior level are known to have a history with the FBI. And as it came out in the course of the Oath Keepers trials, the vice president of the organization was an FBI informant. So the thing is, it's like people just need to understand these, these like maybe in principle, some people are sympathetic to the idea of like a militia organization. Um, but putting that question aside, in practice, these things are fed honey pots. And that's like, it's so obvious and it's come out so clearly, and again, that's another dimension of it because they had, and it came out that the feds had informants and the Proud Boys who were informing uh, their handlers about January 6th as it unfolded in real time. So again, that it's so damning to the government because the whole idea of an informant is you're informed. If they had so many informants in these militia organizations and they're claiming these militia organizations had a conspiracy in advance to do all this stuff... Well, then you would have known about the conspiracy because you had, you know, only million informants in there. And this, you know, harkens back to the, um, you know, the Michigan kidnapping plot, which was like a total entrapment operation where like over half of the so-called plotters turned out to be either informants or feds uh, who, you know, and the feds and informants were the ones taking every single proactive step toward this alleged conspiracy. It was a total disaster. And you know, a little interesting detail as we um, uh, get ready to wrap this up, a little interesting detail. The head of the Detroit FBI field office who oversaw that whole entrapment operation, he was, of all FBI field office guys, he was chosen by Christopher Wray to head the coveted Washington field office in the months leading up to January 6th. That's a hell of a coincidence. And guess what? He just happened to turn out to be the public face of the pipe bomb investigation. And guess what? In the aftermath of Revolver News's damning reporting about the pipe bomb, this individual, Stephen D'Antono, resigned under mysterious circumstances. And now he's leading a quiet, and perhaps more appropriate lifestyle as an accountant at KPMG. And now he doesn't have to answer to the IG. Yeah. So That's it's why. a it's an interesting saga, and that in a nutshell is the Fed surrection. Darren Beatty, thank you so much for coming on the Adult in the Room podcast with moi, Victoria Taft. I appreciate very much your time today and you take care and keep going at it. Pretty awesome Thank you. website. Been a pleasure. Revolver. Thank you. Thank you. And make sure you read the forward, the preface of the January 6th committee report, because it will raise some eyebrows. And this is the um, Skyhorse version of the January 6th publication. So by all means, do it. Read that and then siphon through whatever information you want out of the report. Very interesting. Now, if, uh, one last thing. President Trump's fingerprints anywhere in this uh, so-called Fed direction? 
What do you mean? Well, I, they keep saying that, well, you know, he is uh, he organized. He he uh, made sure that he, he was working with these groups. And all. I don't see it. Do you? I never heard anything about people are saying that Trump yeah, was in the, in the report in the report. Oh, well, yeah, they say it, that he incited. Right. Yeah. But I mean, that's and kind worked of ridiculous. with these groups. He said, go to the Capitol peacefully, whereas <laughs> whereas Ray Epps said, go into the Capitol. That's the in versus into is is a critical difference. And, you know, if, if what Trump said was incitement. You know, how does that explain how they're defending Ray Epps? But no, in the broader context of things, it's, you know, it's ridiculous. And that's another dimension of the whole thing that we didn't have time to get into. But you know, insofar as the committee's report was directed at Trump, which it which it was, it's intended to serve as a continuation of the impeachment process, basically to neuter Trump's uh, political uh, prospects. That's that's sort of the the subtext there. Uh, yeah. But it doesn't look like they were successful, like as with the previous impeachment attempts. So <laughs> I guess I'll have to try again. Darren Beatty, thank you. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Adult in the Room podcast. To keep the programs you like to listen to, please rate this podcast with a fantastic five stars on your Apple podcast app every time you listen. And give me a great review. Plus, of course, subscribe to the podcast. It makes a difference with the big tech algorithm and the big tech oligarchs. And it makes us easier to find. Please get in touch with me on all the big tech stuff. Yeah, we're still there. Using the names Victoria Taft or the Adult in the Room podcast on MeWe, Parlor, Minds, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thanks to 1A Cast for imaging, editing, and production. The fantastic song is Gospel by the March 4th Band of Portland, Oregon. Music for Antifa versus Mike Strickland is Ride or Die by Raps by RC. The Adult in the Room podcast is also a production of Flamingo Road Studios. Remember, head up, heart out, and strive to be the adult in the room. Till next time, mischief managed.